Oh, lots going on. Amen. Amen. Good stuff. Good stuff. I love to see God move. Um, so we're in week four today. So I'm just going to go right into the message, okay? Uh, we are in week four today on this uh, uh, series we've been calling Rooted, which, which is all about tree roots and the fact that we want to have good, deep tree roots so that we could be strong Christians, right? Sounds like an exciting topic. But, but we've been talking about the fact that in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, God says to Joshua, Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth, but meditate on it day and night, he said. And in this way, you will be prosperous and successful. You might remember from week one, Pastor Ricky talked about Psalm 1 and about the fact that we can be shallow Christians or we can be like the, the Christian that's like a tree planted by streams of water whose roots go so deep you can't stop that tree. No matter what season it's in, it always bears fruit because it meditates on God's word day and night. And so today is week four of this message. We're going to go into prayer next week, start a brand new series called Words to Nowhere. You ever, ever pray and feel like your prayers were like words to nowhere? So we're going to explore that. But today, fourth, fourth uh, message in Rooted. Let me start with a story. Years ago, Linda and I had a really cold living room. There wasn't the greatest insulation in that house. And so one of the things that we, and we lived in Illinois, so it's cold. You know what I'm saying? It's cold. Yeah. Um, so, so we're living in this living room, and it's too cold, not great insulation. So we decide to put a new um, uh, fireplace into the living room. Now, that might sound scary, but we did this in the right way, okay? So we had contractors come in, put in a gas fireplace on the side wall, and they framed the whole thing out, and they put the firebox in there, and everything was looking great. But we needed to do some stonework in order to make it pretty. And so we went to Menards, which is kind of like a Lowe's store, and I remember we're shopping for stone, and our eyes got about that big, because have you ever shopped for stone before? It's expensive. And, and there was a whole lot of options, and all of them cost way, way too much money. We weren't sure what we were going to do. And I remember we found this stuff, and they called it veneer stone. And what it was is they, they, they poured cement into these forms and then somebody came along and they airbrushed this hardened cement to look like it was actual natural stone. And we're looking at it in the store and we see the price tag first, right? Because that's what you see first. And you're like, this looks great. And then you're looking at the stone and you're like, it looks just like real stone. This is the greatest stuff ever. And then the salesman foolishly, the salesman foolishly says, why don't you take a sample home and look at it in your house? I mean, he should have sealed the deal with us right then, but he didn't. And so we took one of these, it, it's like a big cardboard thing, and it's got some of the stone on the front. We took it home, and we looked at it in the living room, right where it was going to be, and it looked awesome in the evening light. <laughs> and then we went to sleep. And we woke up the next morning, and the sunshine had come pouring in through the big bay window that we had out front. And this stuff looked awful. I mean, it looked pink and shades of green and all kinds of stuff in the sunlight. And suddenly we understood through a new light that this stuff looked fake. And we did not buy it. You ever go to Walmart and look for furniture? Amen, right? Because <laughs> the price is right. But you don't go to Walmart looking for a new solid oak desk, amen? Like, we're just not going to do that because that's not what you're going to find there. What you're going to find there is wood veneer, right? And what's wood veneer? Wood veneer is like you, you take a bunch of sawdust and wood particles and you glue it all together and then you put a wood-looking sticker on the outside, and that's how you get Walmart furniture, right? And the price is right. But man, if you scratch that, there's no fixing it, and you're definitely not going to polish it, and you're definitely not handing that down as some kind of an heirloom to your kids. Oak, oak is more expensive. Just like solid stone, it's more expensive. Why? Because it's the real thing, and because it takes time, and because it's rare, 
and it has to be mined out, and it has to be chiseled, and it has to be transported to you. Or you've got to wait for an oak tree to grow, and you've got to harvest it, and you've got to shape it. Do you see what I'm saying? This stuff takes a long, long time. And that's why it's more precious, and that's why it's more expensive. Sometimes we settle for a veneer spirituality. Do we not? Sometimes we settle for something that is kind of a Christian sticker placed on the outside of our lives. And God wants us to be the real thing. And he wants us to go deeper. Can we bring the water up front for a second? I'm going for a new record on as many illustrations as I can possibly give you in one sermon. (laughs) Thank you, Tony. Give a hand to Tony, would you? Thanks, dude. So sometimes we come to church, right? And we listen to a sermon, and it's great. And we might come back a month later and listen to another one. And we might dip into the Word of God. And we might listen to some Christian radio and dip a little bit more. And, hey, the dipping's good. Like, there's value in the dipping. Like, you're going to get something good out of a sermon. You're going to get some good out of Christian radio. But it didn't fundamentally change you. And you certainly don't want to drink that, right? Like, I don't want to drink that. Why? Because it has not changed yet from one thing to another. So I'm going to spin this around here, and it's going to be a magic trick later on. Do you see where this is going? We're going to give that time. Why? Because things that are precious take time. Following Jesus and being transformed by him into his image is a, it's not a quick process. It's slow. Right? It's a slow process to change into the image of Jesus Christ and less into the image of Josh Trueblood. Amen? It takes time. It's not a microwave. It's a slow cooker. And it takes time. So I've got a scripture that backs this up. Look at this. This is Colossians 3.16. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and thankfulness in your hearts to God. Let the word of Christ, let the Bible, don't just dip the Bible. Let it dwell in you richly. Let it seep over time. Amen? Because that's what changes us. And we're going to explain that process today and how that process changes us. Just don't dip. Don't dip today. You got to seep. Um, 2 Peter 3.18 says it like this. He says, rather you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All glory to him, both now and forever. Amen. He talks about growth here. He talks about the fact that there's a process. Theologians call this sanctification. That's a fun Bible word, right? Sanctification. As you're reading the scripture, you're going to come across that word and you're going to wonder what it means. Sanctification, just put simply, means to set something apart for special use. And so to sanctify something is to set it apart from the world in this case and say, no, you're not going to be like the world anymore. That's easy to do. You just go with the flow but we're going to set you apart to be like Jesus Christ. And we're going to set you aside for his glory and for his use. Don't dip. you you got to dwell richly in God's word to get that kind of growth. I love that. Sanctification means to be set apart. Now, one of the things that you're going to see in the scripture as you go along is sometimes you'll see that word used for the initial sanctification, the initial setting apart. That's called positional sanctification. What I'm going to be talking about today is progressive sanctification, and you will be quizzed later, I promise. No, not at all. Not at all. Here's the point. When you get saved, you're saved immediately. And you're saved by grace through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. You remember that? Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. That's a life-changing scripture right there. 
And so salvation is not this thing that we progressively do. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. That's, that's a moment, past tense. The old is gone, the new is come. It's done. Some people will come to you and they'll say, hey, you're saved over your life. And maybe your salvation is in question until you die and whether or not you get into heaven. Absolutely wrong. It's not biblical. We, we get saved. Jesus saves us. We become a new creation. And we get to enjoy his grace for the rest of our lives. That's true. And that's salvation. And that's positional. But then the progressive sanctification process starts where we start to grow in Christ. So here's another illustration. Um, if your life was like a house, salvation is the moment where you come and you say, Jesus, the house belongs to you. Here's the keys, and I'm going to hand you the deed right now today. The house belongs to you, Jesus. And then Jesus comes walking in the front door of your house. And what's the problem? Well, the problem is you're still there, amen? <laughs> and he's like, this is a great house. I love it. Thanks for giving me this house. And he's like, I think I'm going to go in to the kitchen and check out the dishes. And you say, no, Jesus, you don't get to go in the kitchen. I gave you the house, but I'm not ready for you to see the dishes yet. I mean, don't we do little things like that? I'm not ready for you to see the dishes yet. Like, like I'm a Christian and Jesus, my life belongs to you. But don't talk to me about my, about my wine issue. Don't talk to me about my pornography issue. Don't talk to me about my education, my retirement, my career. I'm a parent. Jesus, you can have everything, but you don't mess with how I raise my kids. Like, right, like giving Jesus the house means the kitchen and every, every single cabinet, every dark closet, it all belongs to him. But we're not so good at that. And so this process of growth and sanctification in a lot of ways is us re-yielding in reality every little part, every inch of our house to him, every inch of your life to him. And he will come in gently as a gentleman. And you know Jesus, he's going to come in as a gentleman, right? He, doesn't, he just doesn't barrel right over your boundaries. He lets you invite him. And he'll come and ask, and he'll come and point something out. But you're the one who has to say, yes, Jesus, you can have that too. And that process for us, that is progressive. And it takes some time. Can you relate to this today? Linda and I were taking a, a group of couples through the premarital uh, class. And yeah, it was awesome. And, and uh, I just caught this. This was a few weeks ago. And, and, and the teacher of this material, um, we're, we're, we're listening to a sm short video message. And, and, and the teacher just made this mention. He said, you know, my wife and I, we'd been fighting for weeks, maybe even months and we just couldn't figure it out. We just couldn't find peace and resolution. And he's like, but I was having my time with God. When I was having my time with God, the Holy Spirit came in and just revealed to me that this whole problem that we had had, really what it came down to is that I was making everything all about me instead of about us. And I needed to repent of that. And then he just said, ever so briefly at the end of his little story, he said, and I was so thankful that Jesus spoke to me. Do you hear the heart of a surrendered person? The heart of a surrendered person comes and sits down with the Bible and, and says, it's not class time, it's revelation time. It's not class time and morality time, it's transformation time. Why? Because there's way too much of me in me. Some of you didn't follow that. There was way too much me in me, and there's not enough Jesus. And I've got I've to stand down, and I've got to let him take over. Because that little illustration about the house, he's coming in, and he wants every room. You, know, you want to know what another name for that is? Invasion. He wants to invade your life because he thinks he's king there. Is he? He thinks he's king, and he wants to be king. You're going to have to tell him he's king, 
in all those places. And so much of that comes to that moment by moment, Jesus coming and speaking to you. And will you have that receptive heart that that pastor had? Of, oh, Jesus, thank you that you spoke to me about this particular issue today. I'm ready to repent. I'm ready to admit to my wife that I'm wrong. That's a miracle in itself. Amen? Yeah, we need that. Next verse, 2 Corinthians 3, 14. This is awesome. It says, but the people's minds were hardened. And to this day, whenever the old covenant is being read... The same veil covers their minds so that they cannot understand the truth. And this veil can be removed only only by believing in Jesus Christ. Now, it's talking about Old Testament saints there, the Old Testament Jews. And it's saying that because they had not believed in Jesus Christ yet, everything that Jesus wanted to show them, it was like a veil in front of their eyes and they couldn't see anything. They couldn't see spiritual truth. And so then he says, as soon as you believe The veil is removed. So when you first got saved, you now have the ability to hear the Holy Spirit in a whole new way. And you now have the ability on day one to be able to open up the Bible and understand spiritual truth that you couldn't before. So that's amazing, but it's not all. Verse 18. So all of us who have had that veil removed, we can see now and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord who is the Spirit makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. So it says, hey, it's great that the veil is gone and you can see truth now, but realize as you stare into the face of Jesus, because that's what you're doing when you open up his word. You're spending time with the Savior and he comes in. So part of the miracle of that is you're going to change more and more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. The word Christian, it's, it's Christian, right? Christian, it's little Christ. You're meant to be a little version of Jesus Christ in this world. Because what do your kids actually need? They don't need you to read the latest book. They need you to be like Jesus That's what your spouse needs in the marriage. That's what your business needs from you, is that you would change and be less of you and more like Jesus Christ in reality, in behavior, in belief, because that's all the stuff as we change, right? It's power to do the right thing. It's releasing me from bondage to the past and the way that I've been taught as truth comes in. Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. So often, the reason we feel so bound up is because we are believing old lies that were taught to us. When you're sitting down with the the Bible, God's word open in front of you, and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, he's setting you free with truth. He's saying that thing they told you when you were 12 years old that was a lie all along, and you've let it change your life, and you need to be free from it. Here's the truth. And every one of those tiny little steps that we take is closer to Jesus. There's another scripture. I don't have it on the screens for you today, but it even says that when Jesus comes back, we will actually see him as he is. And there'll be something about that moment as our eyes actually see the image of Jesus, we will become as he is. Woo! You are not nearly as excited as you should be about that. Because I can't wait for that. I cannot wait to be done with this struggle I cannot wait to be done seeing one more little bit of destruction come out of my life because of my brokenness and hurt somebody else. I want to be free. Do you want to be free? I want to be like Jesus. And that's what I signed up for. And that's what's coming. But we get to taste a whole bunch of it right now. Now, here's a growth story that I I want to tell you. And And this is a big story, and this is out of the book of Galatians chapter 2, if you're taking notes, or if you're turning there, you can turn there as well. Galatians chapter 2, and there's some players in this story, and i got to tell you some background so that the story makes sense. But just to kind of ruin the ending, what you're going to see is you're going to see Peter as an older Christian, the apostle Peter, and he's going to learn something. And it's going to blow your mind, because Jesus is going to come and find one more room that exists in Peter's heart, where he is not transformed yet. Did I mention transformation is slow? 
And what you're going to see in the story of Peter today is, is hope, not just for new Christians, but hope for old Christians as well. And some of you are waiting to see if I make eye contact with you right now. When I say old, and I am not, I'm sweeping the room. I'm just, I'm going to just keep sweeping, right? But God has not given up on you yet, old people, amen? Praise God for that. I don't want him to ever give up on me because sometimes I got to hear a thing 30 times before I'll finally repent. Nobody else in the room, that's just me. It's all good. Let's talk about Peter for a second. Peter suffered, here's, here's his blind spot. Peter suffered from this thing that a lot of Jewish people at that time suffered from. It was, it was this inherent racism that existed inside the Jewish people. And I know that's a big word, so I'm just going to give it a second. Are you interested yet? Go back to Jonah, and you'll see racism there. Jonah did not want Nineveh to get the gospel. He did not want them to be changed. Why? Because they were another race, another group of people. And the Jews had done this thing. See, God had come to the Jewish people and said, you're my chosen people. And he said, I'm going to pour out all this blessing on you. And at the very beginning, he had told Abraham, he's like, and the blessing's going to go to everybody. And the people that are going to love God, they're going to be like the stars in the sky. You won't even be able to count them. That's not just Jewish people. That's everybody. And so what was supposed to happen is they were supposed to receive just like a crazy Christmas day, all this entire, like the, these gifts from God. It was supposed to just change their world as the Jewish people. And then they were supposed to take the gifts and hand them out to everybody else and say, now you be blessed and now you get the message of God's love. But they didn't do it. Instead, they took it and they said, God must be giving me this gift because I'm special. God must be giving the Jewish people this message because we've earned it somehow. And so they became closed. And again, by the time you get to Jonah, he's like not wanting anybody else to hear God's message and possibly repent and possibly be loved by God and all of that. And then Jesus comes on the scene and Jesus tries to explode this thing. And so some of you guys have read in, in the book of John and Jesus meets with the woman at the well and she's a Samaritan and Jesus sits with her and the disciples come up and they're like, Jesus, what are you doing? Why are you meeting with a woman, number one? But why are you meeting with a Gentile Samaritan woman, number two? And you would think they would have gotten the message, but they didn't. And then Peter has this whole thing throughout the book of Acts where, where the Holy Spirit's given to the Samaritans and he kind of ignores that. And then this whole thing with Cornelius happens and, and Peter gets told that he can eat bacon for the first time, which makes it one of the best passages in all of the New Testament. <laughs> but God's point isn't about bacon, really. God's point is that no people group is unclean by themselves. That God has made everyone equally and the gospel is open to them, and Jesus is open to them. And he tells Peter, go and pray for Cornelius, and Peter does. And you think, again, Peter's got the point. But Peter's in process, just like you and me. And he's got spots in his heart where he's still blind a bit. And even though he's heard this message over and over again, there's a stubbornness in him. Have you ever been stubborn before, anybody? Yeah. Yes. So Galatians 2, verse 11, when Peter came to Antioch, so that's, that's a city, that's a church, Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face for what he did was very wrong. Now, this is Paul talking. Paul's a pastor at Antioch, and Paul is opposing Peter to his face. Do you feel the drama yet? When he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile believers. So pause there real quick. We're in the middle of a Baptist potluck right here. I love that. I love potlucks grew up with them they're the best thing ever so he ate with the jewish with the gentile believers who were not circumcised but afterward when some friends of james came peter wouldn't eat with the gentiles anymore instead he was afraid fear makes us do things doesn't it he was afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. So what you had is you had some, some Jewish Christians who came to visit, and they arrived at the potluck, and all of a sudden Peter feels the peer pressure. And he doesn't want to sit with the Gentiles anymore, because what will they think of me? And so Peter, and Paul notices this. He's got to see the scene. Peter leaves the lunch table, literally, and walks over and sits with the Jews. And the whole rest of the church conference, or whatever they're doing, 
Peter will only, he will only interact with Jewish people. And Paul sees that, and other people see it. And it becomes a real dangerous problem. So as a result, verse 13, the other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy. And even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. And this just shows briefly the danger of when a leader gets it wrong. See, when a leader in the church of God does the wrong thing like this in a public way, it can influence other people to get the wrong idea as well. And so Paul, the reason he's going to come against Peter so strong here, you need to know this, is because Paul sees him poisoning this church. He doesn't mean to be, but that's what he's doing. And so verse 14, when I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel message, I said to Peter in front of all the others, since you, a Jew by birth, have discarded the Jewish laws and are living like a Gentile, why are you now trying to make these Gentiles follow the Jewish traditions? If we could pause there real quick, leave that verse up. Notice what Paul says. He says they're not following the truth of the gospel message. Paul doesn't go to Peter and say, how dare you act like a racist? But he could have. It's not what he says. What he says is, you're missing the gospel. Whoo! That's big. Why? Why is it about the gospel? Because here's a key component of the gospel. There are a lot of things, attributes, if I can call them, that make us us. Maybe you got brown hair. Maybe you got blonde hair. Maybe you got blue eyes. Maybe you got brown eyes. Maybe you're 6'5. Maybe you're 5'9 like me. Like there's a lot of attributes that might make you who you are. You might celebrate those attributes and that's fine. Can even be good. But there's only one thing that gives you value before God. And that is if you have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. And that's it. It is the only thing. It is what makes us brothers and sisters. That's it, and we can't make it anything else, and man, we want to, and the church has just got this history of we want to, and we want to look at other attributes, and we, we want to move it over into this value column, but you can't, and so he, he says to Peter, he says, you've already been acting like a Gentile. What does he mean by that? Well, if you know the, the history of the early church, they had stopped doing their Sabbath on Saturdays. They'd moved it to Sundays. Because they were celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ that had happened on a Sunday. And so they had already felt, the, the early apostles, even Peter, he had started eating bacon and celebrating God on Sundays for heaven's sake. He had already started to live differently. And Paul's like, how can you then turn around and see these Gentiles who maybe have a different kind of dialect than you and they dress differently than you and stuff like that and you're being racist toward them? That's wrong. What you're doing is you're treating them like that's their value. And Peter, you denied Jesus three times. Can we get real? So if we're going to look at religious performance, I don't know that you're first in line, bro. But you got restored by Jesus. And when he restored you on the seashore, do you know what he affirmed? That your value is only based in him not in your performance at all. So Peter, the fact that you're eating with just Jews right now and not Gentiles, it means you've forgotten how much God loves you. Here's my point. Peter was an old guy. He should have known better. He had lots of chances to learn this lesson and he just kept missing them and he just kept being stubborn about it. And he had to get rebuked again. And this is massive. And, and, and you might wonder about this story. And you got Paul publicly like, you know, going after Peter. And it's like, were these guys mad until the end of their days? No, they weren't. If you were here with us last week and we were talking about how you can trust the scripture, do you remember that it was Peter in his epistle that said everything that Paul wrote is scripture? Do you remember that? You got Peter affirming that. One of the things I love about Peter is he screwed up more than anybody else in the entire New Testament. And so I can relate. And I love that even though he screws up so much, Peter is so humble and open about it. But he's growing. What you see right there in that passage 
is the progressive sanctification of Peter. What you see right there is the goodness of the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul and saying, you've missed it in this little corner of your heart, brother. And you forgot how much God loves you here. And we need a little less of you and a little more of Jesus right here in this spot. Amen? Amen. Uh, There's there's some questions and some stuff in your programs where you can even go deeper on some of these passages. You'll see Moses as well. God did not give up on Moses even in his old age. He kept getting rebuked. And he kept getting taught, and he let God teach him. He's not given up on old Christians, amen? I love that. I was, I was looking at my soap journals. We've, we talked about these the last few weeks. So you can, you can sit there in the privacy of your, 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 your own quiet time with God. And you can open up the Bible, and every single one of those moments is this incredible opportunity for him to change you. And so I was looking back at my old journals, and I went back literally seven years ago um, because I was just glancing through these old ones, and some of them, I'll just be real with you, some of them, it's like I'm looking at them, and it's like, well, this verse is what I read today, and under the observation, I've got like, I have no idea what this means, Jesus. I'm just going to move on. You ever have a quiet time like that? It's okay. Okay. Right? Sometimes like we're reading a genealogy or a war, a prophet or something. We just like have no idea what it's talking about. And we just move on. And it's okay. But some of those I was reading back through. And God was coming into my life strategically and changing me. Because I was submitted to his word. I'll give you one. This one is, uh, let me find it. Psalm 119. 83. Psalm 119, 83. And this is King David talking. He says, I am shriveled like a wineskin in smoke, but I have not forgotten to obey your decrees. I love that picture. It's what caught my eye about it. I'm shriveled like a wineskin in smoke. So what they would do is they would have like the the stove that they would cook in in the house, and sometimes they would put the wineskin above it and it would get some of the smoke off the fire and, and that would alter the way that the wine would taste. But if they left it there too long, it started to dry up and crack. Kind of like my skin does when I've been locked in the house during the snow and the heater's been on too much. Can anybody relate to that at all? And David says, God, I'm shriveled and I'm cracked and I'm weary like a wineskin. And what does he mean? Keep reading. It says, how long must I wait? When will you punish those who persecute me? These arrogant people who hate your instructions have dug deep pits to trap me. Not only do I have people in my life, Jesus, he says, who've come against me, but they're trying to trap me and they're trying to hurt me and I'm weary over it. And God, when are you gonna stop them? And God, when are you gonna deal with them? And man, there was just something that day, and I read back in my journal, there's just something that day a- a- as I was reading this passage, I'm like, that one's me. This one's me. Because I had some people in my life, and man, they were making trouble, and it felt like they were making trouble on purpose. It felt like people were getting hurt, and felt like I was trying to solve it. it. felt like I couldn't solve it, and it just went on and on and on and on. And at some point, you're like, God, there's about three people here. If you could just like zap them with a lightning bolt, I think that'd be great. (laughs) And I was feeling that. And then you read. (laughs) I love the way this works. He says, God, when will you punish the people that persecute me? And even though you're feeling all this anger, There's still a part of you that reads that verse and you're like, how dare King David ask God to punish these people? Shouldn't he be more merciful than that? Shouldn't he just want good for them all the time? And then it occurs to me, I'm like, what David is choosing is an alternative. David is saying, I don't want to be the one that punishes them in my anger, God. Why don't you punish them? And what he's doing is in his prayer, He is praying them over to God. And all of a sudden, the light bulb went on for me. I'm like, that's what I need to do. 
Because when I'm feeling this way, I don't need to sit there in my quiet time and be like, oh, Josh, be less angry. It doesn't work. It's not authentic. And by the way, if you've never studied anger before, anger is not a bad thing. Anger is part of the divine character. God gets angry. But God has this magical ability. Whenever he gets angry, good things happen to people. When I get angry, bad things happen to people. What David's doing is he's acknowledging the same thing. God, when I get angry, bad things happen. God, I'm angry. God, would you take care of them? Would you punish them the way that you see fit? And that may not be in my timing, God. And you may not hit them in the way that I'd like you to. (laughs) But I'm, I'm giving them over. And that's an actual healthy process and way to handle your anger, everybody. And I didn't know that that day. And I opened up the Psalms. And David spoke to me and the Holy Spirit used that moment and said, here's a closet, Josh, that you've not opened up to me yet. And you could be like Jesus over here. One bit at a time. It's not a magic trick, right? It's just tea. (laughs) But it needed time. And if you want to change, it needs time. And you can't dip just a little bit of Bible. You got to let it dwell in you richly over time, over years. The process of transformation is slow. I actually titled the message today, Transformation is Slow. And I stood back from the title and I'm like, this is the worst sermon title ever. Because if I was scanning this in a list of sermon titles on YouTube right now, I would never click this one. Because nobody wants to hear that. I don't want to hear that. But it is the way the process works. And so it's, it's true. I was thinking about my kids and how I hate math. Do you hate math? You know, and it's like you watch them go through math in school and you try to help them out at the kitchen table and, 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 and math is terrible. And, and then it finally grows from math into, you know, <clears throat> um, geometry and, and trigonometry and all the things. And you start to realize over time that math builds on itself and, 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 and all this. And I, I just step back and I'm like, God, I just wish they could skip the math. I just wish they could skip it. I wish they didn't have to go through it. It's agony. And sometimes you look, at, you look at people in the same way. Sometimes you look at a dad who's got a brand new kid at home, like Taylor and David have a brand new baby at home, and you're like, oh, God, I wish they could just skip the late-night feedings and the crying and the sippy, cu- sippy cups. And I mean, how many different car seats do you have to buy in a sequence anyway? to get them safely to a seatbelt. There's so much, right? And it's just like, God, I just wish they could skip it. No, you don't. No, you don't wish they could skip it. Why? Because it's every single late night feeding. It's every single, you know, scraped knee and band-aid that you got. It's, it's every single one of those things that make him a dad. It's every single experience that comes together and it becomes the most beautiful thing that you've ever done. And some things that are really, really slow and take years are the best things in your life. And the reason this is the best thing in your life is because you get to walk with Jesus and he loves you and he will not rush you and he will be a gentleman and he's got the best for you. And every single time you meet with him in his word, he, he x-rays you and knows exactly what you need that day. And it's perfect every time. Amen. Let's be like Jesus. Would you guys stand right now? Let's pray. We're coming to the end of this series. And maybe you've been starting this new habit of time with God. And if you have, 
I'll just say it. The biggest temptation in the world is after today to stop. Don't stop. Give it six months. Meet with God every day in his word for six months. If you're like, that long? That much? Yes. 100%. And see what it does to you. See how it changes you from the ground up. Truly. Don't give it six months. Give it a year. Walk with God for a year. Come to the end of it. Come to next January. And you come and find me and you tell me what happened. I guarantee you, you will be a different person in a year. Walk with God. Let's pray. Lord, Jesus, we pray, God, that you would come and that you would be the one who helps us with new habits. And that you would be the one in that quiet place, God, where we're terrified to go. You'd be the one who meets us there. And God, that you would teach us. And that God, you would invade our lives. I'm thinking about all the particle board in this room right now. Change us to oak, Lord. One square inch at a time, Lord, change us. And we'll surrender to you, Lord. In Christ's name, amen.